specific one that she shared that I replayed over and over. And I just want to tell you that, Pat. Thank you for always sharing your heart. You are amazing. So Tabitha and her husband pastor the Bridge Church of God in O'Clockney. So we are so excited to have Tabitha Ruiz here with us this morning. So y'all make her welcome. Yes. And so we prayed. A lot of my prayers were more begging 
them praying. But um, there was a time right at the turn of this year, and I was just praying. And, and for the first time in Cole's life, a lady in church had a word for him. Now, he had never had a word of knowledge given to him, ever. And so um, this lady, I love her to pieces, and she came and she grabbed me because she was doing the right thing the right way. And um, she grabbed Mama and came and gave this word to her, to Mama's son. And Cole's just kind of standing there like this. You know, <laughs> what in the world is this woman doing? But basically what she was telling him was, now nobody knew this, um, the faith uh, questions that Cole had. Um, we did for a while um, allow him to go to a different church so that he could really grow in his faith rather than coming to our church and, and just being the preacher's kid at our church. So that's what brought that on. But he was back in our church for a bit and um, this lady had this word from the Lord for him. And what she told him basically was, Cole, God wants you to know that he has a plan for your life and you're going to have to listen to his word, to his voice, to know what that plan is. And um, it may not be the same plan that your daddy and your mama have. And as soon as she said that, I was like, now, come on, Jesus. <laughs> I don't know that that's a word from the Lord right now. <laughs> but, I, you know, I kept this happy face on because I, won't, I don't want my son to turn away from the gifts of the Spirit, you know. So I'm like, okay, Lord, you take, take the wheel for this one. But she was like, it, it may not be mom and daddy's plans. It may not even be your plans, but you're going to have to listen to his voice to find out what his plans are. So... I said, thank you, Jesus. And, you know, and I asked Cole what he thought about that letter. And he was like, yeah, all right. It's kind of the, the kids say, meh. That's what he was like, meh. It is what it is, you know. I was like, okay. And I was praying about it. And I very clearly remember this. Um, after church that afternoon, I was standing at my curry because I have to have an afternoon cup of coffee after church. And um, I was preparing my coffee, and I was just—I kept praying like all day. I was like a never-ending prayer. God, let him realize that mom and dad's plans aren't that bad. That we have good plans too. Don't let him think that your plans um, just have to be opposite from what mom and dad's plans are. Like that was literally my prayer. Like I knew that my plans were better than God's plans. And <laughs> the, but sitting there with the creamer in one hand, it's like God just completely dropped in my spirit. I have plans for Cole, and you're going to have to let go of yours. And when he did, y'all, it was like I was sucker punched in the gut. I couldn't breathe for a minute. And I just had this peace come over me, like, what in the world was I thinking? He's the one who's, he's the Almighty. He is the sovereign God. Who am I to question God on my child's plans and provision and future when he already has all that worked out? So I wanted to just give that little bit of testimony today to let you know where I'm coming from. I don't have things figured out. I just share what I know. And I want to um, thank Jennifer and Amanda and Miss Colleen again. I love you guys more than y'all know. I'm so grateful to be here. Can we just give them a hand clap for all the work that they do? So our theme for the weekend is mostly the kingdom of heaven. Denim and Pearls is coming from Matthew 13, 45 and 46. And as you guys know, that verse says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. What incredible worth this kingdom has. Amen? Amen. It is so important, so worthy that in Jesus' parable, this merchant sold everything he had was completely penniless just to obtain this kingdom. And that's kind of an abstract thought for us, right? Because we like to have things clearly marked out. We like to, things to be visible. We like to know what we're talking about. And when you think about the kingdom of God, it's kind of hard to wrap our brains around the kingdom of God, but then also where we fit in the kingdom of God. Now, there's something called the law of equitable value, and I hear that real preachers try to teach you something whenever they're up here, so that's what I'm doing. Law of equitable value says something is worth what you are willing to pay for it. And here's a bonus. When others see what you pay for that object, their value of that object increases based on what you pay for it. Are you with me? So I have a few questions for you this morning. First, is the kingdom worth your investment? What is growing the kingdom worth to you? Is it worth investing your time and energy to actually see God's kingdom grow? Now, it's said 
that only 20% of members of most churches actually do the work of the kingdom within the walls and without, and the rest of us are just spectators. Think about your church, for example, wherever you attend. I know my church is a great church. We have several ladies that were planning on being here, and we've had um, some illnesses and hospitalizations in our church, so they send their condolences. They couldn't be here. But our church, our church is for the most part great. The problem is only 20% do the work. Most of the work is done by that very small percentage of people. And if you think about it, it can be quite depressing, very sobering, especially for ministers. And then you think about where the world is today and all that our kids are having to face in their schools and what we face on our jobs. And you realize how badly we need Jesus, but who is going to be Jesus to them when only 20% of us are doing kingdom work? Now, I know, I know you guys did not come here to be browbeat and made to feel guilty for not working more in your church. I know that. You came here to be encouraged and feel better after the day is ending, right? That's why you're here. Well, like my grandmother would have said, my little Baptist grandmother, well, hold your horses. <laughs> so if you, if you stay with me this morning, my hope is that you'll hear my heart and you'll hear this encouragement that I feel like the Lord's given us today. But we've got to take some steps to get there for one thing. That's just how my brain works. But yes, the kingdom only has a few workers. And to be honest, this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus himself told us that the harvest in the field would be white but ready for picking, but the laborers would be few. So here's the thing, I'm a fixer. I wanna know why don't we have more laborers? Where are all these people? What's happening? And why, what can we do to fix it? So in studying for this weekend, I found three main categories that kind of keep us women ineffective. So the first group of people I found are affected by a medical condition called laziness. <laughs> we just don't feel like it. And sisters, those of, the, those of you guys who go with us to our church, you've heard my pastor and my husband say plenty of time, your feelings lie to you. So don't go by your feelings. When you don't feel like it, you probably shouldn't must trust those feelings. Um, the, second, the second group of people that are ineffective is because of consumerism in the church. And that's just a big word to think to make people think that everyone else should serve them. It's somebody else's job to do this. And if I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say, well, ain't that the pastor's job? <laughs> that just completely covers that subject. But here's the thing is I don't think I'm talking to those ladies today. Because let's think about this. Today, on a beautiful Saturday, you guys have invested your time and your energy to be here. We've already seen God work in the altar. And y'all are here to take a little bit of this home with you. So I don't think you guys fit into those first two categories. I believe I'm here today to speak to a certain group of women. We're the ones who belong to that third category. Those of us who know that we're called. Although maybe some of us are still wondering what in the world that calling is. And or even if we have a calling, because sometimes we just don't know and we don't feel like it, right? But let me tell you, friends, you are called, you are gifted. Do me a favor and turn to the person on your right and say you are called. Now turn to the person on your left and say you are gifted. Y'all with me, you got that? Here's the thing though, we can hear that and something still holds us back. And today we're here to break one of those chains, one of the heaviest chains I think that holds us back from working in our calling. Because I know personally what it's like you are so grateful for what God's done for you, what God's done for your family, the works that you've seen him do in your church and your community, and you know that faith without works is dead, and you want to do something for the one who's made all this possible. You want to do something for your, your Savior. So you start allowing yourself to fill the pool of that calling. You start allowing yourself to start moving towards working in whatever area of the church. Maybe it's singing or teaching or organizing. Thank you, Lord, for the organizers. Maybe it's working with kids or working with the senior ministry, working with a social media ministry, cleaning, food pantry, sending cards to people to encourage them. That is a ministry, y'all. Maybe it's prayer for your church. You start to operate in that gift, and you start with a bang. You are getting things done. 
And you know that that's the gift, the calling that the Lord has placed on you. He's given you a burden for that. You know the value of the kingdom that we're called to build, and you're excited to learn how God's giftings will work for you to build that kingdom and care for his people. Because y'all know when you operate in your callings and your giftings, you become, you become energized, and it just makes you want to do more and more, right? How many of you guys have ever been in that place where you're so excited to get things done, right? And then something happens, and we start to notice other people's gifts. We start to notice their calling and how good they are at what they do. And before we know it, we're falling securely into that trap of the enemy called comparison. And what winds up happening then, sis, we totally lose our passion because we're so busy thinking that we're not good enough for our calling like so-and-so is. I'm going to tell you guys a story that I've had to work through. When Jerry and I were younger, we were able to meet uh, another ministry couple. They were a young pastor, and um, the husband's name was Scott. He had gotten saved when he was like upper teens, and from what I hear before he got saved, he was known as, oh, what did they call it, an um, amateur horticulturalist. He liked to grow his recreational items himself. <laughs> so he, he made a complete 180 switch when Jesus found him, okay? But he was so on fire for God that from the time he got saved and started working in the ministry to the time the Lord took him, um, for because of some complications from cancer, he was only about 33 if I remember correct. But from that short time, just a little over a decade, y'all, he personally led over 1,200 people to Jesus. Over 1,200 people, this one guy, Scott Harvell, led. So I've known them for a while. His, his widow is the most beautiful thing, most graceful, graceful thing. At her husband's funeral, she sang praises and kept a smile on her face because of how real her relationship is with Jesus while they were burying her husband. And y'all, they have been such an inspiration to me. But sometimes I would allow myself to look at them, and I start feeling less than because I knew I had a calling on my life. And I've managed in my 42 years to bring like six people to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and Scott had a hard life, y'all. He, he went through chemotherapy and radiation like two or three times. I mean, it was crazy. But he personally led over 1,200 people to Jesus. And I would feel so bad about that. Why can't I be like that? What's wrong with me that I am not more in your face and extroverted and like when I meet somebody, can I just... Do you know Jesus? Can I help you to Jesus right now, right now? I'm just not like that. Why, why can I be like that? And I would find myself praying, God, change me so that I can reach more people like Scott. God, change me so that I can be more extroverted. Y'all, I may be up here. I'm not an extrovert, just the FYI. When I leave here today, I'll probably, like, shut myself in my room and put covers over my head just to let you know. But I am not that person, but I would feel so bad that I wasn't because in my mind, in order to be effective in the kingdom, that's exactly what I had to do. I had to go be a Scott Harvell or a Benny Hinn or a Billy Graham and lead so many people to Jesus and knock so many people out in the spirit. And I thought that's what I should have been like. But the Lord very clearly dropped into my spirit. Sometimes I feel like he just kind of hits me over the head with things. Because I think he knows that's what I, that's the only thing I listen to sometimes. But I was at work, I worked for a physical therapy clinic, and between the new step bike and the recumbent bike, I was kind of cleaning up that little area, and I was kind of complaining to God this day. And I was like, why can't I be more effective in the kingdom? Why can't I reach more people? Our church is growing, and that's a great thing, but then you realize, oh man, I've got to do more. You know, when that happens, and so I'm like, why can't I just be like these people that can do this so effortlessly and they're reaching everybody? And God told me, that's not your gifting. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? Everybody's supposed to be bringing people to Christ. That's what Christians do, right? We are called to lead others to Christ. And this is what I feel like he taught me. He said, yes, but some are called to the kingdom to be evangelists. Some are called to be administrators. Some are called to be prophets. And some are called to be encouragers. Now, y'all stay with me because I know that I may be speaking something that some preachers might not speak because we want everybody to work for the kingdom, right? <laughs> Here's the thing. God has a mighty plan for each of us. 
but we have to stop what I call the cancer of comparison so that we can reach the people that we have been called to reach. Because the people that Amanda can reach are going to be different than the people I can reach. The people that Miss Chrissy reaches, totally different than the people I reach. The people that Angie reaches, totally different than the people I reach. But if I try to be like Angie, I'm going to turn people off. If I, try to, if I try to sing like Amanda and Jennifer, that ain't going to work, y'all. I'm just telling you. <laughs> but we have been given a gifting and a calling for a reason. When I said that it's, it's called the cancer of comparison, and I truly mean it's like a cancer. Because once you allow that comparison to take root in your heart, what winds up happening is it starts spreading and taking over all the other parts of you. Things like your joy is going to take over and kill. Things like your passion is going to take over and kill. Things like your anointing, your obedience, your effectiveness, that comparison will take over and kill. And why in the world did God decide to drop that on me right then? The answer is yes. We are made to lead other people to Christ. The problem that we make for ourselves is when we get distracted from doing what we've called to do by focusing on how other people do it. See, Romans 12 and 6 through 8 tells us, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Let me read that first part again. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And then it goes on, it says, if prophecy according to, to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his ex exhortation, he who gives with liberality, I love that, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. He straight up told us in his word that we would all have different callings and we are to use them how he gave them to us. Now, remember when I said I'm still learning, I'm still working through my faith, right? When I learned that it's okay for me not to be a Scott Harvell, I felt such a freedom and a relief come over me because, yeah, I'm not Scott Harvell or Karen Wheaton or Billy Graham or Kim Jones or whoever else you want to put in there. I'm, I'm not one of those fireball, hell, hell and brimstone preachers. I can't sing like our Maverick City favorites. And I'm certainly not a theologian like some of the podcasters I lean on and learn from. But what I can do is encourage. And I can love. And I can teach from what I've been through. You see, I knew my calling. I had just allowed myself to feel so much less than because of that comparison that I didn't find the joy and the passion in my calling anymore. So I didn't operate in it. I did not operate in it nearly as much as I should have. I had to get to the point where I accepted that my calling was different, that I was different than someone else's. And I had to realize if he called me, he was going to equip me. Because I happen to believe that if the God of the universe is a big enough God to save me from the pit of hell, then he's a big enough God to give me what I need to reach the people he wants me to reach. Amen? He has created us all for a purpose. And I'm going to give you guys proof. How many of us have, are there any note writers, like whenever somebody's preaching or you're learning something, you have to write notes? Mm -hmm. You're going to have a few verses to write down, I'm sorry. <laughs> So the first one I'm going to give y'all is Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I'm going to sip, take a sip of water so you can think about what I just said. We are God's masterpiece. He's created us a new, we are a new creature in Christ Jesus, so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I don't know about you, but just knowing that God has plans for me gives me peace. We all have that calling, we all have those gifts. 
But I need you to know this morning, God has given you those gifts for a reason. He planned for you to have those gifts. And he planned for you to use them. Amen? Now, you can do things that some other people can't. Only you can reach people that I'll never be able to reach. But we have to open ourselves up to our Father so that he can use us how he created us so that other people can come to his kingdom. That's how we show the worth of God's kingdom. We work for it the way he created us to. John Bevere, have you guys ever heard of the Beveres? John and Lisa Bevere, they're great Bible teachers. Yes. One thing that I heard him say once was that when it comes to the gifts that God gives us, we can do one of three things. One, we can use them to build the kingdom, which makes sense because God gave them, might as well use them for his kingdom, right? Two is we can use those gifts to benefit ourselves. And we all know we could fall into that trap when we get our eyes out of focus and don't keep things where we need to keep them. But the third one is the most tragic to me, and that is we could choose to neglect the gifts that God's given us. To neglect the gifts that our Heavenly Father has given us. Guys, how many of us have neglected our gifts just because we thought we couldn't do it like so-and-so, or we weren't as good as this one, or I'm not as educated as that one, I'm not as pretty as that one, so I can't be on stage. Or maybe we didn't think we were being as effective as someone else. I learned something through my, uh, my makeup business that Amanda mentioned. Um, I love it because I am such a nerd for like personal development and anything I can do to try to make myself better because I do believe that God is working in me, but I think it's my job to work in myself as well. You know, so I love to do things that kind of make me think about how I can get and become a better person. And one of the things that I've learned, um, do we have any perfectionists here in the house? Ah, I thought so. <laughs> the problem is when, you, if you have a perfectionist, and I believe that some women are perfectionists and don't want to call themselves a perfectionist. I'll just be honest. But when you have a perfectionist, sometimes we get so um, focused on everything needing to be just right that you kind of become paralyzed because you want it to be so right that you actually don't do anything at all thinking about how right it needs to be. Oh, look at those people in the back row looking at each other. <laughs> but we, I, I kind of feel like we all do that, some of us more than others. But there's a saying that I heard uh, a little while ago that says, done is better than perfect. Done is better than perfect. Say that. Say, done is better than perfect. Now, how much, let me just let me just flesh this out a little bit, because we all like things being perfect. We like them being pretty, right? Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. But how much more effective, how much more impact would you have doing things the best that you could versus never doing it because you don't think you'll ever get it good enough? Do you see how that works? We can get so bogged down trying to make it just right that it never gets done, and then who's, who's benefit from that? Done is better than perfect, especially in the kingdom of God. Because let's, let's face it, none of us are perfect. We serve one who is, and God's going to bless. As long as we're obedient, God is going to bless what we're doing anyway. We just have to be obedient to do it and get ourselves out of the way. Just get it done. And I know, I know that there are people here, but they're going to be like, but Sister Patty, I, I, really, I really am not as anointed as that person. I really can't sing like that. And, all I do is just scrub the toilets or mow the yards for them. You know, I don't, I don't really do all that. And I could argue for hours, well, maybe not hours. I won't do that to y'all. About how, oh, there's no small job in the kingdom. Every job is important. And it's true. But if you have your mind set on being the underling, being the one who's not good enough, I'm just going to drop some more scripture on y'all. Y'all ready to write down? All right, here's Romans 12, 4 and 5. This will be familiar for you guys. It says, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. 
We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. We all belong to each other. It kind of makes you wonder, does the left hand get jealous of the right hand? No, they just work together to get things done. Let's move on. 1 Corinthians 12, 22. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weak, weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Now, I did not even know that that verse was in the Bible until I was studying for this message. And I'm a pastor's wife. See what reading the Bible will do for you? So in, it says, in fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. So this got me thinking, let's say, you know, I work in physical therapy. Let's say I had a patient that come in um, who needed the knee replacement. And instead of replacing their knee with one of those bionic knees, the super strong things, they decided to take a piece of their heart muscle and replace it. Now the heart muscle is pretty, pretty strong muscle. You guys know that, right? By a different measure. But as soon as that person would put weight on that leg, that heart muscle, as strong it is, as it is, would give out. It would not be strong enough for that job, right? But then you think about it, the heart muscle is what keeps you alive. You can't live without a working heart muscle. It may not be the strongest part of your body by a bone density measurement, but it is the most necessary. So no matter what your job is in the kingdom, you are necessary. Say that with me. Say, I am necessary. Just don't believe the enemy's lies of comparison because the truth is we all have a kingdom calling I think a lot of us kind of get intimidated by the word calling so just in case we have any who are uneasy with that word just let me share a little bit if you are a Christian you are called that's how simple it is if you are a Christian, you are called. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be anything gross. It doesn't necessarily have to be anything that gets you out of your comfort zone, although don't be surprised when it does. As a Christian, you are called. So the last year or so, almost a year, I've been on a journey to get healthier. And um, one of the goals that I had as a um, as a healthy person want to be <laughs> is to be a runner and when I, I actually completed the Rose City run a few weeks ago and I was very excited to do that I did not die thank you Jesus <laughs> just in case you were surprised by that did not die but um, I when I first started months ago I'm trying to train for this I was I'm still in the process of losing some some weight and I'd already lost quite a bit by this time but I knew that I couldn't just like wake up the morning of the race and be like ready to go. Okay, let's go run 10K. Mm -hmm. That would not happen because then I would die, just FYI. But, <laughs> but what I started doing to prepare for this is months and months ago on my lunch break, because I'm busy and I really don't have a life. So on my lunch break, I would start and I kind of, I started walking and then I would run and I'd be like, I try to run like a tenth of a mile and then, <sighs> By that tenth of a mile is over, I'm like having to walk just because I couldn't breathe. And then as more time went on, I would run a little bit longer, walk a little bit, run a little bit longer, walk a little bit, to the point that before I was ready to do that, um, the uh, 10K back in April, the, for several weeks prior to that, I was doing five or six miles a day just to prep so that that day I really wouldn't die. The thing is, um, I learned in the running world there are runners who run a lot faster than me. And if you're surprised by that, then, well, that's okay. <laughs> a few people actually run slower than me. You're probably not surprised by that. I wasn't. But while I ran that 10K, there are some runners who run more than a 10K. They'll run a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. Some of them run a full marathon, which is 26.2 miles. And then I have some friends who want to go the like way beyond that and they run what they call ultras and that's anywhere up to 100 miles at a time <laughs> yeah i get this a lot when i say that <laughs> that's just crazy talk <laughs> but it doesn't matter honestly 
In the running world, it doesn't matter if you run a 10 minute mile or an 18 minute mile, you're still a runner. And you know what? It doesn't matter if you're like me and the most I will probably ever run will be a 10K. Everybody wanted to know, oh, when are you doing your marathon? Oh, no, ma'am. That, that is not what I've been called to do. Thank you. <laughs> but maybe I will only run a 10K, but then there are other people who run the ultras. But the thing is, we are both still runners. In the running world, there are no qualifiers to be a runner based on speed or distance. If you run, you're a runner. They don't label you as a jogger or a runner wannabe. You're a runner, period. That's how it is, sisters, in the kingdom. There's no such thing as a more gifted or anointed Christian, despite what you see on social media. You're a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you have a calling. And if you have a calling, which we know we do because we're a Christian, you see how that works? Then you have a gift. My parting thought is the same as the Apostle Paul's. Ephesians 4 and 1 is this verse. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. A life worthy of your calling. There's that word again, worth. We're talking about the worth of the kingdom, and now all of a sudden we've switched to the worth of your life. Is our life worthy of being called into the kingdom? Your calling is the pearl of great price. You've got to value your calling so that it will cause you to work and do things, active things, on that calling. Whether it's as good as somebody else's or not. Because someone will see you working in your calling and they will ascribe value to the kingdom. They will give glory to God because of what you are doing. Because they will see how much you value your calling. And that lets them know how much you value the kingdom. So since I'm asking you today, don't waste your kingdom calling on comparison. You are a child of God. And you are called. Just like those runners. They are a runner. Period. You're a you are a child of God and you are called, period. And that's all we need. That's all you need to know. Don't get start, started with all the comparisons because we know the more we compare, the more we get distracted, right? That's not what we're here for. And that's all I have for you. speaking a little bit longer, but at this time, I think bigger, um, Jennifer and Amanda will come up. They have some awesome things planned for us, I hear.